they really understand the concept. And I will say a few. Uh, and he later, he also uh, states that any is an elegantly simple concept, but also a slippery one that is hard to pin down. And just when you think you understand it, a new wrinkle appears that gives you a pause. And I cannot count the number of times I was exactly in this moment that I think I understand something, uh, just to realize that I don't understand another think about the affected population size. Uh, so why, why is it so? Uh, so the first confusion, I think, comes with the diversity of definitions. Uh, and here's the definition that probably most of you uh, recognize from the uh, principle of population genetics textbooks. Uh, the effective population size of an actual population is the number of individuals in a theoretically ideal population having the same magnitude of random genetic drift as the actual population. And this is exactly the definition that you can understand each word in it, but still, uh, if you want to describe what it actually means, it can give you a trouble. And I think many of the teachers of population genetics, if you ever uh, had to teach, uh, teach what is effective population size to students, they have very they may have a very hard time to understand this uh, this definition. And part of the difficulty comes uh, with. Uh, the thing that you really have to understand what this theoretically ideal population here is, which is a right Fisher population that has certain characteristics, it has constant size, equal sex ratio, random mating, uh, and uh, so on. But estimation and interpretation of any uh, is essential in diverse areas of uh, evolutionary biology and conservation genetics, and also leads to formulation of several any definitions that emphasize various aspects of drift. So in, apart from having what, this one textbook definition, we have several ones. So we do have an inbreeding any, variance any, uh, again value any, coalescent any, linkage disequilibrium any, gene diversity any, and many, many more. And I think it's, and I won't go into details here to explain uh, dif these different definitions, uh, but I think it's really important to understand that we do have these different definitions that emphasize different aspects uh, of drift. And if you want kind of a cheat, 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 uh, I could refer to an excellent paper by Nice Riemann and colleagues where they have this huge table and different definitions. So I use it a lot. <laughs> Uh, and I recommend it as well. Uh, yeah. The second confusion comes with uh, the time scales. So the diverse applications of any concept uh, resulted in largely independent methodological uh, developments that use with different definitions, uh, but also focusing on different time scales. So we do have uh, current and contemporary any that many of you are interested uh, in, but we also have a historical any, short-term any, long-term any, temporal any trajectories, and the conf it can be very confusing for the newcomers to be filled because in the literature people usually refer to any, but rarely they refer to the time frame they're talking uh, talking about. Uh, and the final confusion comes with uh, geographical structure uh, that is very 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 tightly linked to, to time aspects. So at any time point your any refers to, you can, may think also about the local any for the local population that you have, but also about the global any, like a whole species any, uh, or a metapopulation any, when you have a metapopulation structure and the populations that are connected with the uh, gene flow. And to illustrate this concept, Let's uh, look at this uh, at this graph here. So here is the true any changes over over time in, in yellow. Uh, the time goes uh, in this direction. So here is now and here is long time ago. Uh, and if you think about the time and structure, so here is a population that, if you look at the recent times, here is a big population that has declined. Let's say to the habitat fragmentation and uh, it was divided into several subpopulations that are now connected. To the, the gene flow, but it also can happen in the like very long time 
time perspective in ancient times, like many, many years, many generations ago, but at any point here you can actually have the structured, uh, structured population. Yep. And now the question is what NE we actually estimate? And uh, I bet that if you ask 20 random evolutionary biologists to estimate NE for a, a favorite species, they will uh, either estimate the local NE here, uh, metapopulation NE, NE that will also incorporate this recent time and this decline here that was here. Some other will calculate or estimate the NE for like a global species-wide NE and some others will focus on this um, ancient or historical, historical uh, uh, NE. Yeah. And what I also found very confusing when I was reading about and trying to understand anymore is this division of the field into the recent any contemporary any and historical any. And what my impression is that usually if you read papers from one field uh, and the other, they, these two rarely talk to each other kind of in the literature. So you can be, uh, and it can be very, very confusing. At least it was, it was very confusing for, uh, uh, for me. And what is, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, and what is confusing is this, these two subfields use different methodological approaches and are associated with different challenges. Uh, and they differ in the time frame they, they estimate uh, uh, any. Uh, yes. So we have the contemporary NE that many of you uh, know a lot probably. Uh, this is very important for the small populations endangered, uh, managed and harvested. Uh, and if you talk about the time frame uh, of a contemporary NE, the uh, time scale, it represents an e either in previous generation of or several generations back in time. Uh, and it very much depends on your data, approach, species life history, sampling strategy and recent demographic history. And to illustrate this, uh, this concept, I again, we will again focus on this uh, cartoon I made and we simplify this a bit. So first uh, let's look at this part here. So we have now a bit simplified version. So we have a bigger population here, a smaller population, a decline in recent uh, times. But let's say we, uh, we monitor this population and we got samples, DNA samples from uh, like uh, yeah, now and uh, several generations uh, back in time. Uh, and now we can use several approaches to estimate contemporary NE. And one of the most popular ones are the ones that use this time sampling to get the temporal NE estimate. So here's the cartoon I will extend over my talk. So here's a, 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 a time in, uh, in generations on the log scale. So this is very, very recent, 10 generations back in time, let's say. And here you have three different methods that you can apply for uh, temporal methods where you can use this temporal sampling and estimate, uh, estimate uh, uh, NE. And, but then we, you can also, if you don't have the temporal sampling, you can use the single time sam uh, sampling approach and you can use another method uh, here to estimate uh, NE using only this sampling or this sampling or this sampling. Yeah, and what is important is that if you use temporal samples or the other or single sample uh, approaches, you can get different NE estimates, even though your aim is to estimate current effective population, uh, population size. Uh, especially if your demography is, is changing. And to illustrate it with the real data, uh, this is the work that we've done on flycatcher uh, system. Uh, so this is, we, we had exactly very like exactly with this sampling but we have we sampled the island population of the, of these birds uh, in two times 10 generations uh, 10 generations apart and then we were interested in estimating contemporary effective population size and we used three different temporal methods using the looking at the other frequency changes across across time uh, time here and it got a nice estimate of quite quite big population with a nice credible intervals here but then when we used another approach and we only used this sample or, or this sample we got very different estimates with non-overlapping even in some cases non-overlapping credible intervals and that uh, told 
does two things. First, the first thing is that linkage disequilibrium methods, uh, if you have a quite big population, they may be not very useful and reliable. So we'll often get this infinity uh, intervals, he intervals here. But also, if you, it also tells us that uh, the temporal methods and the linkage disequilibrium methods can differ if uh, if an, uh, uh, population is actually declining. And this is what we checked with another method. Uh, we used GON analysis to, to draw a recent any trajectory over time. And I will talk about this a bit uh, a bit later. But we actually see that, that yeah, this population has uh, has been declining over recent uh, recent years. Uh, so. To sum up, this like depending on the method that you use and the data you have in hand, in the declining population, you may get very different results for the actual contemporary effective population size that you're interested in, right? Okay. And then on the other hand, like on the part of the spectrum, we have this historical or long-term uh, NE that is usually used in the historical demographic inference, speciation research, uh, or is used in the selection scans to get a kind of a null model. Uh, and if we talk about the time it refers to, it usually the NE that we estimate here is usually a harmonic mean uh, over an expanded period, extended period of, uh, period of evolutionary history uh, of a species. And this is very often model-based. Uh, and even though the evolution of the field is from very simple models, when we assume like single population, close, no migration, towards the more complex model incorporating metapopulation structure, uh, migration rates, changes in effective population size uh, over time, so like the bottlenecks or like expanding populations, it's still like a very much simplification of the real, of the reality. And to illustrate it again with this, uh, this graph here, uh, we can try to design a simple model for this true any changes here. So we may be interested in the ancestral population size. So this part of the curve will be summarized by ancestral population size here. Then we, you may be interested in this bottleneck here. So this will be the mean over this time here will be an any of the bottleneck, e of bottleneck population here. And then again, the harmonic mean over this time here will give us a descendant population uh, size. Yeah? And now if we extend this uh, picture, uh, this figure here, so we have a contemporary any, and here is a long-term or historical any, it's a bit different uh, model here with takes into account the expansion of the population here. But we got this point estimates, which are represented here by this uh, bar plot. Uh, here of like for ex that correspond to the extend harmonic mean of extended periods uh, years of time, which is a like yeah real simplification of the uh, of the reality, and it does not really take into account any structure that could have been there, right? So it's always like a kind of a any of a metapopulation at that uh, at that time. Okay, but now information on temporal and age changes is crucial aspect of demographic history, often missing in the methods that I just uh, told you told you about. But it can be very important to have, so we can provide information on species responses to recent and historical, and like combining this inf this uh, information on how species uh, responded historically to the. Uh, climate change, for example, like global changes, climate changes, and how they respond now can be very can be very interesting. They are also useful in ten interpreting other any estimates, as uh, I showed with the flycatcher example. That we it really puzzled me when I saw it. Like, what the heck is like? Why do we have like such a nice estimate here, and then you have so much so different, so much different estimate if you use another method? And how can you make sense out of it? Uh, 
And this uh, can be uh, approached with like estimating temporal continuum of any so these curves of any changes o o over time. The idea is not new; it dates back to the skyline plots like that were around for yeah, quite a long uh, time, and probably some of you will use this uh, this approach as well. But the real explosion of the methods came with the new sequencing technologies uh, and the non-parametric uh, non-parametric models. Uh, and here again we have this division into the recent trajectories and historical trajectories, uh, which is good to keep in mind. Uh, keep in mind. Uh, and here is the uh, here are several examples of different methods, uh, and he, again, these bars here correspond to the time frame they can estimate the trajectory. So here is like an exemplary trajectory of any over time, and here are different methods uh, co that corresponds to different time uh, they can provide estimate uh, for. And you can see that many methods uh, do this like the long term or historical. Uh, trajectories. Uh, an another uh, estimate, more recent ones, there are a few that actually can span the entire spectrum, but they also come with the cost of very heavy simulations, and uh, and not all the models can be explored uh, here. So the question is, can we really infer the whole any change, like whole any? Ten, ten, oh. Can we really infer uh, the whole temporal continuum uh, of any or not? So in theory, yes, we can apply different approaches and different methodological approaches, and to kind of a bridge, yeah, bridge, uh, bridge the contemporary and uh, historical perspective. However, which is very important, each method has its own requirements and assumptions, and even if uh, any trajectory can be reconstructed and inferred over the extended periods of time, you really have to keep in mind that the, like, the reliability of estimation can differ in different, uh, different times. And this comes uh, from uh, from the data itself. So we may have problem like we can uh, different methods that are uh, that are, are here. You need to have different uh, data. So sometimes you need just a single genome. Sometimes you need uh, linkage uh, information or recombination landscape across the genome. Sometimes you need only like a small sample set, sample size. Uh, sometimes you need a lot of individuals. Another I think uh, that can influence demographic inferences differently in different methods is the selection. And I won't go into details here, but if anything, anybody is interested in, for example, influence of balancing selection and structural variance of effective population size, I can, I can, I will happily talk uh, afterwards. Uh, what I want to, what I want to uh, point to here is the structure. Uh, that it's really important to keep in mind when you interpret uh, effective population uh, size and effective population size trajectories. So again, if we look at this uh, this um, cartoon uh, and we talk about the contemporary effective population size or recent any trajectories, uh, we may uh, and you think about the structure that influences any. Uh, estimates. But the question that we always have to keep in mind is are the populations that you're looking at, that you're investigating, are they really isolated or they create some kind of a metapopulation structure? And the questions like like here, right? There are several populations that connected are connected via the some levels of gene flow. And the two most important questions that you have to ask always is that how much are these populations connected? So how is there a little gene flow or is there a lot of gene flow there? And how diverge are the subpopulations? So is it the continuous gene flow that is there, or the populations has been separated for a long time and then due to like recent events, they just got in contact again. So they, uh, we are mixing with very diverse populations. Because the answers to the questions will help you determine whether the effective population size you're estimated, estimating is either overestimated or under, uh, underestimated. Uh, and if you want to have uh, an overview of the influence of the 
migration, uh, which is an excellent paper by Kimberly Gilbert and Michael, Michael Whitlock, uh, where they evaluate different methods of contemporary effective population sizes uh, um, together with migration, uh, uh, taking into account migration that comes with a meta population structure here. Uh, but in the, so in the case of uh, the recent populations, we may, from your ongoing study, you may have an idea how much they are connected, right? Because it's recent, it's very recent past. But there is no uh, no way we can know how they were connected in like like many many like millions of generations back in time, right? Or thousands of generations back in time. Uh, and what is very popular to do uh, with the genomic data now is to reconstruct this PSMC or PSMC-like curves, uh, where you, so here is the effective uh, here is time in log scale, here is the effective population size. Uh, this is from the recent uh, recent paper. Uh, here they, they studied lemurs, I think. So there are different lemur uh, species, uh, and they reconstructed the. Uh, long-term trajectories of the population size here and it is very tempting to interpret these bumps here as a increase in population size and then decline but you have to always remember that such bumps can be a product of a population that got fragmented and isolated into several different populations and they go back uh, together uh, again. And it was explored by a series of uh, theoretical papers and simulation papers by Shiki, Shiki and colleagues uh, that I recommend uh, uh, to read. And here in this paper of Lemurs they really showed that, so here is this yellow thingy here that corresponds to, to this one, but they models they they, they modeled uh, a demographic history that included a metapopulation structure here with, uh, with different connectivity across time. So here is the connectivity, the uh, darker colors is more connectivity and less connectivity. And they got similar pattern. So the effective population size was, if you take the, like, like the metapopulation effective population size was constant across time, but what you get is the PSMC, like the PSMC curve here, uh, that could uh, be produced just by the change in connectivity between these populations. So whenever you have a PSMC-like curve, you always have to think about these bumps as uh, not only the increase and decline, but it can could have been produced by the like the structure that was there at this at this time, and this is very likely that we, due to the like glaciation, refugia, whatever the changes, uh, that we did have this structure and different connectivity patterns in the um, at that time. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I think that it is possible to to infer the entire any continuum uh, and it can bridge this recent and long-term perspective uh, but it you always have to think about the reference to time so it's not meaningful to discuss effective population size if you don't refer to the time and if you don't think about the spatial or geographical geographical structure so if you want to infer any effective population size always ask about the definition time frame and the influence of geographical structure Structure. And I really think this is a very exciting time to uh, to be and to look into new methods because uh, I really think that the, there will be a rapid progress in this in this respect, uh, and uh, we will see more and more studies showing or trying to infer the entire continuum uh, of a species of an, uh, any of the species, uh, and it will be facilitated by the, probably by the machine learning approaches and the haplotype result population genetic data. I really hope that uh, the methods that will incorporate this potential spatial structure in the past will be uh, available at some, uh, at some point. Uh, yeah. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for, and I will Thank my group, like this is a one my extended group uh, with my small group here as well included. But all of this, many of these ideas that I had uh, about or 
problems with, uh, with understanding the effective population size come from my uh, previous lab in, in the Uppsala University and it really benefit, I really benefit, benefited with uh, discussions with Martin Ludo uh, and also my like, uh, co-authors of, uh, of uh, this recent review that we, uh, that we wrote. Thanks a lot. So, thank you for the wonderful talk. Do we have any questions? Uma here. Thanks, it was a great talk. Um, I think it's also uh, really important to talk about uh, these time scales uh, from the perspective of you know things like load and so on because if you have a larger effective mm -hmm. size and then a bottleneck and then a smaller really small contemporary size and so on i think it will be yes. really interesting to uh, kind of contrast uh, I don't think of ways to contrast uh, and historical that, and yeah. contemporary and how that affects uh, load and future. Yes, definitely, definitely. And I'm not sure, I think that there is not so much research on that, uh, if, uh, if any. Some people yeah. have brought it up in reviews, like you yeah. guys had uh, a little bit about it in your review. But I think it will be really nice to do it in the context of species uh, and think about. So basically, in a lot of, uh, well, a lot of endangered species have large ranges which are fragmented over time, right? Uh, so there's also kind of um, mm. prior, uh, like, structure change uh, type of knowledge you may have, change population structure knowledge you may have, and it would be nice to bring those kind of ideas also into these uh, well, analysis. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Um, so uh, it, it was it was like a really good summary of everything. Um, it's you. it's really fun to revisit a lot of that stuff. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm thinking is just kind of my train of thought is if we look between estimators, many if not all of these estimators are some derivation of of theta from some other population genetic parameter, right? Like for example, LDNE, we can take a linkage to equilibrium formula and and derive theta um, and if because of the assumptions that go into each of these different um, estimators um, comparing between them especially when making management decisions is risky um, yes. even even within an estimator if we if we take coalescent any right you if you use uh, Watterson's estimator if you use uh, like the number of polymorphisms you're going to get an order of magnitude different any if than Tajima's estimator if you have an expanding population yes. so for example um, if we're looking within LDNE which tends to be the most common estimator I, I, I see when people are making management decisions. Um, it's concerning to me that um, there's the assumption that there's a constant population size, particularly for LDNE, which is sensitive to population size fluctuations. If you're trying to make a management decision and say, which population should I prioritize? Um, what do you think is kind of the move forward when comparing any estimates between populations when almost no demographic history is going to follow that? Yeah, so I would say that if you can use temporal NE estimators, but sample at different time points. So from my experience, this is most reliable uh, ones and will capture this different, especially for a small population, because there is like a, always, it's difficult to do it for the larger populations, but it's much easier for smaller populations. And you don't really need to have so many generations apart. So usually, so it depends on the, uh, how many generations per year you have uh, and whether you have overlapping generations or not. But a few is sometimes, a few few years apart is often enough to be able to get the uh, any estimates and uh, and then if you if you already have two samples then if you can also use this one sample uh, or LD based estimates and you can compare so you can um, you can try to to do the similar thing that is we did with, is with the flycatcher data but if you have a temporal samples I this is the and no other choice I would do the temporal samples if you if you have only one sample uh, I'll try to get the temporal samples I, I think <laughs> uh, thank you thank you so much yeah Hi, um, thank yeah. you for such an awesome talk. Um, I was just wondering how uh, temporal NE is kind of affected looking at like 
species specific and like a highly uh like a harem style like species like highly um polygynous or polygynous or um polyandrous species oh <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a hard question i don't know uh, uh so wellness questions i don't know uh but it validates the assumptions. Yeah, it validates the assumptions, and this uh, oh hasn't been. I don't remember whether somebody looked. Uh, does anybody know? Like, with, um, a couple of any from census back yeah. further. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's very complicated. <laughs> I only ask them. I yeah. do a lot of like yeah. northern elephant seal work, mm -hmm. and yeah, they're highly yeah. polygynous. So, just wondering about that. One more question, maybe? So, okay, this may be a silly question, but you say the future is um, we should have some kind of haplotype uh, mm -hmm. resolved genomes. Um, yeah, we should have uh, obviously this done for individuals and not pools of uh, individuals. But what about um, if one would benefit from all this? Um, so we know what kind of data will um, be and maybe programs that you mentioned approaches will be good for some time scale to some kind of create the super program that basically goes through yeah. all of the captures this yeah. info and <laughs> uh, I think that the super program is like it's super hard to get the super program because this is really it is really so it is really a division into the recent and historical and the, and it's like an every like the time scale it really if you look if you want to look at different uh, time points on the temporal continuum it really uh, you really need to have a special data for that uh, so I imagine like the the software that will incorporate many different approaches so it gets easier for people just to have your like you have the data different types of data you can incorporate it and then you can send it to the program and you will get uh, different parts of the continuum using one one kind of a mega program that will uh, use different approaches and different uh, different estimates but uh, due to the compl this complexity and uh, like the different data that you want to have and different assumptions that are associated with the data and the different time points that you want to infer any for, it's very difficult to get like the super program that will do everything for you. Yeah. All right, I think maybe it's time to move on. Uh, we can have more discussion during lunch and, and later, uh, but please join me in, in thanking Christina again for a wonderful <laughs>